watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Annabelle Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT supervisor and therapist here in fabulous Las Vegas. I'm really excited to welcome to the show today. We have Ali Barbosa. He is our EFT trainer in Mexico. That's right. We now have an EFT center in Mexico. And Ali is a licensed marriage and family therapist. He's a certified EFT trainer, supervisor, therapist, and he's over on the southeast side of Mexico in the Yucatan. So if you guys ever want to go do a training in Mexico, ole, let's go. <laughs> so and he's agreed so wonderfully to join us on our show today. And we're going to be talking about the tango, the EFT tango and some challenges or blocks that come up as we're trying to work through the tango in session. So thank you, Ali, so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you, Annabelle. I'm very honored to be here in your show. Thank you. Wonderful. So if, if we could just maybe start off with a refresher to everyone watching the show today, um, can you remind everyone what the EFT tango is and sort of what the purpose of it is? Yeah, well, um, we have always the Sue uh, explanation of the tango, which is a macro intervention, just a set of little interventions to guide us through the, through the therapy, through every session in the therapy. And the easiest one to me is that the tango is our best friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a very good friend to the EFT therapist because it always will tell you where you are and what you need to do next. Okay. Ah, and how does the tango do that? Well, it gives you a guide. It gives you actually a guide of what interventions you need to use, okay, depending on what stage you are in the, in the mm -hmm. therapy. And it will tell you uh, what to work towards, like what, what you should, why you should be doing this because you're going towards um, somewhere specifically. Right. And the overall goal of the tango is to set up an enactment yeah. at the end. But there's sort of a process that you have to go through to get exactly. there. Exactly. I love what you said. It helps guide us as to where we need to go or what we need to work on because either it'll go smoothly and we can highlight that a new thing just happened and the mm -hmm. couple is, you know, maybe ready for a shift or the opposite will happen and it goes terribly and it'll like some blocks or challenges will come up and depending on what move of the tango we're on and that yeah. little block pops up will tell mm -hmm. us what yeah, it is. The good thing about the tango is that uh, even when it gives us a sequence of what to do, it's move one, two, three, four, five, it, 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 we, we can always go back. Yes. We can, we can always go back and, and start again at move two, for example. If I'm yeah. doing an enactment and it's not quite working, we can always go back to move one or move two and, yeah. and work from there too. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome about it. It doesn't have to be a very linear thing. A linear circle. I love right. how you <laughs> it's not necessarily a linear circle and if if something comes up it's okay to go back and it's you know how Sue always calls of course it's the tango so it's like a dance you know when we're learning dance steps it's not very often where our dance teacher will teach us a couple steps and say okay do a whole dance right now it requires some repetition of certain steps before we can yes. do or move around the dance. Yes, and that's going to happen. The tango becomes uh, very natural to us. Okay, yeah. when you have done this uh, long enough, it just becomes your usual way of working, and it's wonderful. It it really yeah. becomes a part of your work. Yeah, I love that because you know the goal is we want couples to start talking to each other and telling each other these things, not telling us. So it does. I love how you said that. It feels very natural that, yeah, we do want to have that natural part. To, okay, start talking to your partner about this because I'd like to work myself out of a job here. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. a successful couples therapy. So, so talk to us, Ollie. So I imagine that there's different types of challenges that may pop up at different moves of the tango. And, you know, so let's just talk about Let's start at the beginning, if that's okay. And can you talk to us about what types of challenges might be more common to pop up with move one of the tango? Yeah, definitely. So, um, of course, move one is what we're going to do most um, at the beginning of, of the therapy, right? When we've just met the couple and we have to do a lot of assessment, right? And after that, we have to track the cycle. We know that. 
which is steps one and two. So yeah. we basically do those um, in move one of the tango, okay? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we can easily get lost as to, um, they bring a lot of information, a lot of content, right? Or they speak too fast or they jump from one um, thing to another. So uh, one of the challenges for move one, uh, one of them is just to have a focus on what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Like what, what, what are we really assessing, right? Yeah. So we're trying to keep, the, keep an eye on or to sniff where emotion is. Even, mm -hmm. even when they're talking about reactive moments, okay? So we know that where reactiveness exists, there's emotion there. So we, we're gonna lean towards that just to track, okay? Not to, not to deepen, not to heighten, just to track, just to know what is there, what's happening, what's, um, when does it happen, what's attached to, what does it have to do with attachment, okay? So basically that's one of the main challenges to recognize what's, what's, what's useful and what's not. Yeah, and I love how you said that. And it can be really hard when clients bring in a lot of content or they're super reactive and you may have to play traffic cop a little bit more. It can be hard to kind of figure out what's important, what we need to pay attention to. Yeah. Sometimes people bring content that's really compelling yeah. and easy to get hung up on the content. And I love how you said that we're really wanting to go towards the emotion after all this emotionally focused, right. <laughs> you know, and you said something so good. You said, what does it have to do with attachment? Right. When I, I noticed that question has been so helpful to me when I start to get lost, my, I'll go into my head. What does this have to do with attachment? And sometimes I may even say that explicitly, like when I'm trying to track and figure out what I'm after and I feel like I'm getting lost, I may have to say, okay, I remember I asked you about this part and I, I got kind of lost in this story and I'm trying to wonder what this story has to do with your relationship or your bond with your partner. Can you help me understand? Mm. And sometimes that even helps them come back on track and, and get us all back to, yes, that's, that's the point. What does this have to do with attachment? That's a great idea. I'm going to borrow it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great that you do that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So how do we stay on track? How do we know and move one of the tango? What, how to stay with the emotion and not go too deep? Because I do know a mm -hmm. lot of us have, you know, I think kind of older versions of teaching EFT, we were so anxious to move past the reactivity, right? Yeah. Into reactivity, and the clients weren't ready for that. They were needing us to attune to their reactivity. Mm -hmm. But when they're bringing so much content, it can be so hard to figure out like, where do I start? What, what am I, how do I even Figure, sort through the mess that's right here. Yeah, yeah, that can be a challenge, definitely, because it just um, pulls us in. Emotion uh, can pull us in, and we would want to go for the big moments, right? The big deepening mm -hmm. moments. But yeah, as you just said, it's it, we're not, they're not ready for that yet. So the most uh, useful thing to do in move one is to reflect the most evident thing in the room, which is the behavior. Mm -hmm. The the moves in the, the moves in the dance they have, right? Like what they do and what's the attachment intent of mm -hmm. that, right? So we're trying to listen to what they're saying to the, not get caught up in the content, but we're also looking at what, what each of them is doing, okay? Of course, we need to identify who's pursuing and who seems to be defending and withdrawing, but we're actually trying to see how, what this person is doing in the room or what he or she's saying that and they do outside of the room is related to the attachment. So um, learning how to identify and to reflect in the moves, like, okay, you seem to be, okay, you seem to be talking about um, this thing that happened um, the other day during the week, like your husband uh, wasn't there on time, right? And I can hear you even right now um, giving me um, many um, examples of how this affects you, how, how, how this has been bad for you, right? It's almost as if um, maybe this is what you do when you need your partner to know uh, what's your struggle, right, in this relationship when, when you cannot 
um, you know, when you cannot find him, when you cannot meet him in the ways you want, like I, I may start reflecting the moves and the possible intent, the attachment intent right there. I love that. That's brilliant. So it sounds like what I think I kind of hear you saying, Ali, is that we're almost kind of making clear the function of their behaviors and mm -hmm. how that behavior functions to either try to get them closer to their partner or maybe protect them in some way. But we're really just kind of mapping what it is that they do and how that matches with their, their goal or their intention. Right. I want, I, I, right now, in my early days, it wasn't that way, but right now I would never go deeper into an emotion when I haven't fully understand their exquisite, the exquisite logic behind it. Okay. Yeah. The logic behind the reactiveness that I know, like, because what they're doing, even when they're reactive, has a logic. It makes sense somehow. But I need to get it first. If I'm not getting that, that means that I'm not ready to jump deeper with them. Right. You've got to get it first. We as therapists, and then they have to get it second. We have to, and third, we all have to get it all together before we're ready to go somewhere deeper. And I love that. I think one of the older catchphrases would have been, we have to arrive at the reactive emotion before we can leave it. So I love what you're saying is to really stay put in the move that you're working on until you fully understand it. So it's really clear for the clients before you kind of charge ahead and go on to something deeper. Like, does that make sense to me? And are we all in on this understanding together? Yeah. Yeah. And definitely they appreciate, um, they appreciate leaning into anger, especially that happens to me um, in, in, in the office. Um, let's make room to understand your, your anger, right? Mm -hmm. Not go to the pain. You, you, we know the pain is there. We may reflect that, that there's also pain there, but the, the main character remains the anger. So let's understand what the anger is saying. And that's, that's very, um, they appreciate it too much. Oh, really yeah. Good. And I think that in and of itself has been really challenging for therapists is to be able to make space for anger because anger can activate our threat cues, right? Yeah. So yeah. When, a, when a client starts to get really big and loud or yell or get angry, it can be like, whoa, <laughs> what's this? Yeah. But paradoxically, you know, paradoxically, they will come down when, when you make room for their anger, they will start calming down. Yeah. Cause Cause they're, get, yeah. Yeah, because their anger is really trying to get something heard and understood. And when you can lean in and hear and understand, I love, as you said, the message of their anger, then it will start to shift and calm down. Yeah. yeah. That's so lovely. So move one, it sounds like you're saying the challenges can be you know, for the therapist, just trying to understand what makes sense of what we see in front of us. And you're saying to really talk about what we see most obviously, which is the behaviors and make clear the function of the behaviors and how that functions in the relationship to either, you know, to impact the attachment in the relationship. I love how you said, what, what's that got to do with attachment, right? Yeah. Into real and and it can also be a challenge for the couples too because especially if they've waited a really long time to get therapy so stuff has built up they can feel very adamant about wanting to share their stories or you know but I found it to organize it and make clear the function and as you said you know you kind of talk when you talk about what it has to do with attachment like the example you mentioned when you want, when you can't find your husband or get close to him or, you know, feel like he's there with you, you know, this is the strategy you use. In a way, it helps them, you kind of summarize the core of everything they're fighting for. And then it doesn't feel like I need to fight for that content so hard because you just totally got it. Right. Another good thing to remember about move one uh, that's especially important is as, as the therapy progresses in stage one, it is very, very useful to have a very focused move one in, 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 at the beginning of the session. Okay? Uh, most of my trainees all, um, tell me, or supervisors tell me, oh, um, should I extend the, the length of the session? Because when I get to those emotions to enact, it's too late. The session is almost over. So I never get to move three okay, in the tango. And 
that's also good to remember. It, you don't need a longer session. You need a better move one. Okay? Mm -hmm. You need to focus right at the beginning of the session, right? Just a quick checkup, like how are, how are you today? And can we go back to your cycle? Okay, you know, last week we were talking about how you get triggered when this happens and then you get triggered by this. And then we go right there because that will give us enough time to keep working with the tango um, for the rest of the session. Maybe do two tangos, I, I don't know. But I love that. You're saying you don't necessarily need a longer session. You need a more focused step one, which is so helpful. I think that was something I didn't learn so well until more recently, how much move one really kind of sets the tone, it sets the structure, it sets the focus. And if we don't establish that clear focus, and like you said, coming in, having a very clear move one really helps establish for you, the therapist and the clients, this is what we're working on in this yeah. session. Yeah. That's yeah. so good. I love that. So being able to have that now. Now move two, what is move two at the tango? Well, move two is just to um, go deeper and to start to assemble the emotion uh, to deepen it, right? Um, the first thing we need to um, understand or maybe remember about emotion is that we need to know our basic six emotions, okay? Um, not too many emotions. There, there are many, many, many emotions out there, but right. there are just six core emotions. So if we know them and if we know what, um, what their intention is about, okay, what they want, okay, we will recognize them and we'll know how to assemble them easier. Because okay? what usually happens is that people um, start probably with sadness and they will jump to sadness and frustration and grief and then uh, anger about this. And it's a lot to assemble. Just focus on one emotion. Okay? And of course, if it seems to be another emotion, we will assemble that. But to remember that there are only six vulnerable emotions that we work on. Okay? It's very, very useful. And can you help everyone know what those in case they're thinking, oh, what are those six vulnerable emotions? Well, the most common for us in move two, there's sadness, of course, but we need to contextualize sadness with attachment. So sadness about the loss of the connection, okay? Sadness about the loneliness, okay? Loneliness is not per se an emotion, it's just a part of sadness. So um, it's sadness about missing someone or missing something about someone right so this, there's sadness there's shame of course we know that shame is a compound of other vulnerable emotions we have anger when, when it's primary primary anger which is about um, um, violation of um, our dignity which is about um, having been transgressed and hurt and we have also um, fear which is the king in, in EFT we, we're always looking for threat and fear related to attachment, okay? the fear of losing our person, the fear of um, being rejected by, by our primary attachment figure, the, the fear of being left alone, the fear of not belonging, okay? those kinds of fear. And we also have the positive, the surprise and the joy, uh, which sometimes will show when, especially in stage two, <laughs> when we finally guide him to secure attachment, we will see a lot of joy and surprise. I love how you say that. So, and, and on that note, I often tell my couples, you know, cause in the waiting room, you see other couples leaving. I'm like, if you see a couple smiling as they leave, they're probably later in their work. <laughs> you know, it's not always possible to leave smiling, but you know, I love how you talked about, um, you know, in state in move two, you know, we're getting more of the reactive and primary emotions, but we're also with the primary emotions, not just like saying, oh, you're sad, oh, you're hurt. We're connecting it back to the relationship, which is your moves three, steps three and four in right. stage, right, mm -hmm. is understanding the primary and reframing it in terms of the attachment relationship and the cycle. Um, so I really love that. It, they're not just sad. They're sad because they can't get close to their partner or they're not just afraid. They're afraid because they might lose the connection or they don't feel good enough or whatever it is. Right. Another thing to remember about those emotions is that each one of them is not a single thing. 
they have different components. They have elements. There are the Magda Arnold uh, model of emotion, it's a, it's a, a dynamic one. So we might be getting continuously one side of, of, of that emotion. We will be shown the, um, the behavior, the, the, the behavior side of the emotion. Okay. We may be um, getting the sometimes cues about the, the physical, the, the, somatic, the, the, the body perception part. Okay. We will be getting something cognition. So we need to learn how to work with those to assemble. Mm -hmm. Because when we're continuously assembling those elements, so um, we, we mention, we always should mention the cue, which is where emotion starts. And when we bring back the cue, when we um, mention the cue, we're opening space for that emotion to arise, mm -hmm. okay, to come to the room. And we can um, continue making this emotion alive by mentioning or, or evoking the other elements of emotion until it's a very organized thing for mm -hmm. the person and then that's where he or she's going to be ready to deepen okay and i'm thinking so the little light is going off in my head one of the challenges that probably comes up certainly i've experienced is what happens when you're trying to go for that primary emotion but the client just will not go there they want to hang on to frustration they want to hang on to disappointment you know, more cognitive or reactive layers, even though you, the therapist, it probably feels very obvious that there's mm -hmm. a deeper thing hiding underneath there, but yeah. the client just does not want to go there. Yeah, if that's happening, that's a clear sign that you're not ready for primary emotion, that they're not ready. I always say, um, I always use this image of, if you're trying to pull primary emotion like a carrot, like you're trying to uh, take a carrot out of the ground, and you're, mm -hmm. and you're forcing, you're not being able to, it means that um, you're not there yet. Primary mm -hmm. emotion is something that just emerges naturally as a mm -hmm. result of good validation, okay? yeah. as a result of being there. And it just, it, you won't have to fight for it. It will just come up, but you need to stay long enough uh, with, it, with the secondary for the primary to, to arise. Yeah, oftentimes I think some of the ways we get clues is that Client may be talking about anger, but they'll also be crying. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the ways I can start to plant the seeds for primary is when you see, you know, kind of co-occurring emotions to say, oh, it, it seems like a part of you is really angry, but then I see tears. Help me understand the tears. It seems like maybe this other part of you is hurt or sad, but they're like, yeah. Then, you know, even if maybe they're not ready to sit more deeply in that yet at least you can kind of save that and and yeah. once you sit with the top layer oh let's go to the hurt and using the parse language is a great idea there because you're not denying this the reactive protective part and you're you're making room for both you mm -hmm. have this you're of course you're angry because of this and that but there's also pain in there there's also part of you that's that's aching right mm -hmm. and you're making room for both and you will see where the client will be leaning towards Sometimes they spontaneously do. They, they start talking yeah. about the pain. Yeah. Now, what, what other kinds of challenges may come up? I, I'm thinking maybe some self of the therapist issues that come up around yeah. being into emotion. Can you talk oh, a little bit about that? Definitely, yeah. One of the most common, I think, is that um, in Move 2, many folks will try to, will not be aware of how fast they're going, how fast they're talking. And that can only be noticed when we watch our own videos, okay? Because mm -hmm. sometimes it's just, and the primary is not coming up because we're going too fast. We're, we're, not, we're not talking to the limbic system. We're just talking mm -hmm. to, the, to the cortex. So, um, yeah, one of the challenges is going too fast, not allowing enough, enough silences. And when we do that, it's because we are very uncomfortable with emotion our window of tolerance for emotion um, gets um, triggered. We, we, we get really uncomfortable and we, and we try to just make it like, it, just get it over with, you know, <laughs> just make it happen. Yeah. So we need to increase that, that level. Yeah. Of, um, so you're saying sometimes, you know, being able to make more room for emotion, which sometimes can actually heighten and, and give that space so that we can go deeper and sit in it, but sometimes therapists, if they get triggered, their own fear of leaning into emotion, you know, 
kind of understanding what the therapist move is when I get triggered, when I, if I get afraid of working with emotion, what's my move? Do I rush in and jump on, jump in on the silence and start filling it up with intellectual discussion or, you know, do I maybe try to push the client into yeah. their primary emotion yeah. without be yeah. making that sense? And if we're more uh, like an avoidant, um, we're going we're gonna to go for the exits. Um, if the client exits emotion, we're going to say, thank you. And, we'll, <laughs> and we will encourage them to exit. Ah, yeah. yeah. So that's a challenge. Yeah, because the, the partner really needs us. So, you know, part reminds me of another function of the tango is to help make these scrambled to unscramble the emotional signals and make them clear and helping the clients to communicate more clear signals. And I often hear, you know, the beginning EFT therapist, they'll start doing move one and move two and they'll say, okay, I understood what they do. And I heard that they feel sad. Now what? <laughs> right. Like, right. Exactly. And that happens everywhere. You would be surprised that everywhere I've been to people get this uncomfortable feeling of, okay, the feeling is alive, the emotion is alive, and then what? And most of the time, what I hear is that people uh, feel bad, therapists feel bad about themselves to, to keep clients there in emotion. Mm -hmm. Like, it's almost like a reflex. I need to get them out of the pain, okay? Right. right. Like, I need to protect them that by somehow highlighting it or leaning into it or, or deepening it is going to make them feel worse. And yeah. so they may avoid, feels like, I don't want to make it bigger or, you know, get lost there, make it worse. So I need to avoid. But when we avoid, we don't honor the emotion and help it heal and yeah. almost might be set free in the way that we need to. Yeah. And, and therefore, we won't have a good move three, a good mm -hmm. enactment, okay? Because we need a very, um, a very assembled and deepened emotion to, to enact. So. Yeah. When we, um, when we cannot stay with emotion in a good move two, and, and, and I like what Sue says. In the new book, Sue says something fascinating about move two. Move two of the tango has two different parts, you know? One part is the assembling of emotion, the organizing, making sense of it, okay? Making enough room for it. And then the second part of the move two, it's a deepening, okay? How the client is going to increase um, his or her engagement with the emotion now that's organized, it's, it's being co-regulated and they can, get they can get closer to their emotion themselves to find something new there. Right. But that and requires it, silence. Yeah. It sounds like in move two is where we will come into contact with the client's window of tolerance also, yeah. and maybe even our own window of tolerance. And that's yeah. where you're going to really see that come alive in move two is if I ask the client to sit in their emotion and they can't sit in it, it's going to tell you that's where they're, window of tolerance is. Right. And of course, you're going you're gonna to adjust, uh, but, and, and you're going to leave them some space to breathe. Of course, you, you're just not going to pressure. But, but sometimes this happens, this happens more often than, than we're aware of. People could stay longer with emotion. The client mm -hmm. could be able to just stay there and feel it okay, mm -hmm. for another five seconds if, you just got, if, if we just get quiet, if you just give yeah. them enough room for that. Yeah, being able to make space and, you know, pain demands to be felt and yeah. we need to be able to feel it. We need to let them feel fully seen and yeah. heard their pain. And so that step two can be really powerful, but not to be afraid, you know, like you're saying, if, if they're not ready, if they show that they're not ready, then it's okay to adjust, right? It's, it just gives us still information, helpful information as to where the client is at. And maybe right. they've had trauma, maybe they've had no one show up for them. So of course, we're going to make sense and validate why it's so hard to go there. And then, you know, we might go back to organizing. This is what happens. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And of course, depending on what stage you are working with, right? If you're in stage two, you're going to allow more time for deepening. Right, that's what's necessary. In stage two, you're always assessing. You're always assessing what this window of tolerance is. Okay? Yes. And we try to respect people's uh, limits, but we also want to encourage them to gradually go right. more and more towards, the, towards that emotion. Right, so it sounds like we kind of slowly want to stretch the window without yeah. trying to 
break it open. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. Flying out of the window. We just want to increase it and expand it. Yeah, that's exactly it. Okay. Yeah, that's so really awesome. Another thing to remember about move two is that um, even if people exit, okay, sometimes people will spontaneously exit to give us another piece of information, content. And sometimes uh, we may not be aware of how we lose our tango. So we work for nothing. Mm -hmm. So if it's possible, we can just say, okay, so I'm, I'm listening that you're also mentioning this, another example of how you get triggered, but can we stay with this one for now, please? Okay. So we must complete our tango. This is something I learned from my mentor, uh, Silvina Irwin, which was very helpful. Like always remember that if you started working towards a tango, if it's possible, mm -hmm. okay, try to finish it. Just stay, stay your focus, okay? Try to and stay there. Stay there and go to the move three. Uh, yeah. What were you assembling? Yeah. That's a great point. I, I notice sometimes when we even start to enter into that window of tolerance and as clients maybe are feeling really understood for the first time, their tendency, they're, they're feeling so safe that they want to bring in more and say, great, now that you're hearing yeah. me, I want you to hear all of my pain. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it can be like, you know, like something like I get how, you know, as this painful part gets touched, as we start to acknowledge this, that you want to bring in more examples of how this shows up in your relationship. And I appreciate that. And, right. you know, would it be okay if we kind of stayed with this feeling that's attached to all these examples? <laughs> that would be perfect. <laughs> what you said is perfect. Yeah, of course. And that will allow us to, um, to work in a more focused and organized way. Mm -hmm. Because if not, and that was uh, an old mistake of mine, we would be just always jumping into one, move one and two, move one and two, and we would be making fewer enactments. So, yeah. 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 And I, and so move three is where we actually have them enacted, right? Yeah. Yeah. So move three can be very tricky because one of two things will happen, right? Either it'll go really well, which is great, or they'll give that dreaded response when you say something like, uh, can you turn and tell your partner about your sadness? Well, I've already told my partner. <laughs> they already know, right? Yeah. There's that big block that comes up that says, oh, what do we do? Well, there are many things you can do. Um, one of them, it's, it's, very, it's, it's advice that we always check um, with the other partner, okay? What's happening in that side of the couch? Because, you know, sometimes when people have, when people refuse to enact, a good, um, a good percentage of the time, they're right to fear that enactment. It, I've learned that um, if, if I turn to the other one, and I haven't because I haven't, I see they're upset. And that doesn't make it safe for the enactment to happen. So then it, it would, they would be right not to enact. Okay? So it's very, very um, advisable to always check before asking for an enactment, just see on the other side what's happening. If that person is, it's, um, it's watching, it, 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 are they interested? Are they, or are they, do they have the face they have when they're reactive? Okay. Yeah. And, and if, the, if the road is open, if, the, if it's safe, it's very useful to, um, to ask the enacting partner before they enact, can you take a look at your partner right now? What do you see in, in her face, for example? Okay, what do you see there? Okay. In, in, so, and most of the time they will realize that this might be different. They will have a safer um, experience. So that helps sometimes. Yeah, I love how you say that. So a lot of times they'll get afraid to share and that fear is a good, has a good reason, right? Maybe yeah. they're looking at their partner and seeing that they're angry or they're upset, which is sending them the signal that this is not going to be well received. So that would be danger. But sometimes they just get afraid because you know, maybe their partner outside of session has been reactive. And even yeah. though their face is saying it's safe now, it's still scary. It, we're like asking them to jump off a high dive into the yeah. pool of emotion for, this, yeah. for the first time. Yeah. Even though it may be safe, it's still scary. Yeah. And it's a good thing to know that, okay, most of my clients have told me that they fear that uh, moment after the session. What's gonna, what's, what that evening is going to be like, you know, they actually fear 
uh, what's, um, how, how this could play out outside of the room. So it's a good thing to know and to catch that one because we can actually do an enactment about that. Like I'm afraid of um, turning to you and opening up and this turning into something bad after the session. Okay? Nobody wants to have a nightmare <laughs> that, yeah. that day, right? And, and that's, a very, that's a very safe um, that's a very safe enactment if it's if it's from the person if it's I am very afraid of okay I want to open up but I am very afraid if they point at the other person that's gonna be a disaster if they say you're gonna you're gonna accuse me after the session you're gonna that's that's gonna turn out bad but if they talk from their self like okay this is me uh, part of me wants to open up but the part of me is afraid of how's gonna be next okay? mm -hmm. that's a very safe enactment I guess I like how you're saying that sort of the the content of the, or the, the direction of the enactment would be sharing something that's, that's view of self. And right. stage one, that would look more like, this is how I feel, this is what I'm afraid of. Instead of saying, you never show up for me or you're gonna do this, right? Instead of poking or blaming their partner, which yeah. can happen in very early um, stage one. And oftentimes, you know, even though they may be ready to share sometimes when they're starting to share something vulnerable and sad for the first time, it does provoke a new signal, a new response in their partner. And, you know, still it's, it's, we don't have to be afraid if the enactment doesn't go right. I love that you're saying that. Okay. Because even when enactments don't go as planned, they're getting us closer to the blocks yeah. okay, to where we need to go next. Yeah, and can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, of course. Um, I, I don't know, George talks a lot about blocks and to lean towards blocks and, and, and he's very, very wise saying so. Um, even when a partner doesn't accept and it's reactive, even when they shot a bullet, okay? Mm -hmm. What we need to do is just, oh, you know, validate that something happened. Like this wasn't as I expected this to happen and you opened up, you were vulnerable, and I'm so sorry this didn't come across as vulnerability, you that wanted to, 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 to say, but I'm very, very interested in knowing, okay, what's happening for you. Okay? And that's another tango. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's another, uh, that's, that's just like indication of, of knowing here. You need to work here, and you need to understand what's happening here. So that's exactly what the therapy needs to be about. Understanding that, that bullet, understanding that block. Okay. Usually when we lean into those blocks without being scared of or without being angry at the person, we're going to find something very, very important for us, which is the, uh, the working models. Yeah. They're going to they're gonna show up there, right there. Yeah. I love how you say that. So, you know, when a client shoots a bullet, this could either be the person doing the enactment that maybe you've just gotten them to turn and talk to you about their sadness and you think it's going to go great, perfect, you're in your sadness, turn and share that with your partner. And instead of turning and sharing about their sadness that they just so eloquently told you about, they turn and they, they poke their partner or they shoot them a bullet and make a you statement. And it's like, okay, something just, that's information. Something just happened there. I noticed it was easy to tell me about your sadness, but it wasn't so easy to tell your partner something happened there right, right yeah. or the other could happen is they do share their you know we'll just use sadness as an example say they share their sadness but i like how you said that working model is it might trigger something in their partner a lot of times what i hear is they feel bad they feel like the bad guy some reactive form of shame starts to pop up that causes them to kind of like push away from the sadness and so that's information too, right? It's, it tells us what, what's there and what we need to focus on. It's very valuable information. You're gonna need those. You're gonna need the working models um, to stage two. <laughs> so it's very valuable to be able to just jump into them and understand them and how they, how they work, how they guide perception. It's a very uh, useful thing to do. Yeah, and, and so, Move three is the actual share, is the actual enactment. And so, you know, if there's a block there on either side, that's still great. It's still going to tell us. Move four is kind of where we 
the process. This is what just happened. I asked you to share. This is what came up or, you know, whatever. Um, and then what is move, move? There's a move five, right? What is move five of the table? <laughs> oh, we're skipping move two. So just a quick thing about move, move four. I'm sorry. Uh, just a quick thing about that. Something I've learned um, from one of my mentors is um, when we're in stage one, and we're in stage one, when we're processing the enactment, we want to make the processing as close as possible. Okay? Maybe the open question, and what was this like for you to hear, might be too risky sometimes, especially at the beginning. So we basically can ask them a, a, a question, a guided kind of question, okay? Like, how did you like this? <laughs> or do you prefer this kind of, um, do you prefer this uh, when your partner turns to you and be and as vulnerable as he was or the usual way? We can process in, in, in a way that will give us uh, an obvious response. Like, yes, of course I prefer this or, or, or yes, I like this, okay? And even, so even when they shot a bullet, and even if they say something else, you can use parts. You can, mm -hmm. you can say, okay, you can say, okay, part of you likes this. Okay, but well, a part of you still mistrusts, right? So yeah. You know, yeah. I like how you're saying, well, and if, if it doesn't go well, I feel like it, you know, move four will be a little bit quicker as we start to move back to move one, processing what just happened can tie right back into another exactly. round exactly and if it went well you know then i kind of use that move four as a way to deepen the experience this mm -hmm. good thing that just happened um you know and deepening also sometimes not not necessarily so psychoeducation but just letting couples know when they're getting it right you mm -hmm. know when they're starting to be more emotionally vulnerable and intimate with each other, I'll say, here it is right here. You just did it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes we, that's a flexibility of the tango. As you said, we could go, if we have enough time in the session, we can start another tango without doing the move five until the end. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll do that until the end, or we would stay in move four and just allow them to savor the new experience to really uh, take it in. I love that savor. That's beautiful. That's a perfect word. And sometimes I might actually use that to kind of go back to three and do another enactment yeah. where this was so beautiful. I really, I could hear you more clearly. I, I finally got a clear signal of your hurt and I wanted to hold you and comfort you. Oh, great. Could you turn and tell that to your partner? <laughs> exactly. 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 We want to do those when, when, when that's, when there's that chance, we want to do that enactment back. Okay. We can go, that's the flexibility of the tango. So you are already moved four and you can go back to move three with this other person. Okay. And make them enact something simple, something very simple, nothing that opens up too much, especially if you're towards the end of the session, it's something simple, something that's in response of what's been shared. Okay. And something as, Oh, thank you for showing me something new. Or, oh, I appreciate that you took that risk with me. Okay? Or let me, let me tell you, it's not how you feel it. I actually do care in those moments. So mm -hmm. it's a very simple thing, not allowing too much of it, because if not, it's going gonna, it's gonna to open up things that you're going to have time. You're not going to have time to, to take care of, but it's always very special when, when that happens. Yeah, I love that. And I just love that you use the word savor. That's such a good word to describe that. It's like when they, when it goes really well and smooth, you know, clients need those corrective emotional experiences. And, and we want to, we want to really encode that into their limbic system, right? We don't only want their limbic system experiencing the deep hurtful parts, but we want their limbic system to deeply feel the good parts. Like this is what success with your partner feels like in emotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. savor in it, relish it. And you know, something that I've also learned over the years, um, when they spontaneously touch after an enactment, you know, some, if, if this is working well, even when they're enacting, the partner is, is maybe um, um, touching their hair or maybe just playing with their, um, with their finger in, you know, something very tentative, something very sweet and taking their attention to that in move four, okay, like, did you know this? 
okay? your partner's hand touching your shoulder or, or maybe he was taking your hand with both of his hands. Like, do you notice that? Like, how does that feel? Okay. Maybe making it more motor sensorial. Okay. That's, that's a very um, nice thing to do too for them. Beautiful. I love that. And then my brain instantly goes to, I've noticed stage four is where you can start to see the cycle come up alive again, especially on traumatized clients mm -hmm. where even though they may be getting the very thing they've been asking for, part of them doesn't know how to trust it or take it in. And so they might go right back into reacting like, yeah, you know, and they may turn and fire a bullet like, oh, you're doing this now, but why couldn't you do this a bunch of times before? So, yeah. you know, even after you've had a successful enactment, the cycle can still pop up. The clients can still get reactive and, if it's the end of session, you, you, your move five is where you're kind of summarizing and we used to call it tying a bow. Like, look at this cool thing that you just did. Um, sometimes that bow has to look more like a tourniquet, right? Where we don't, you know, now they've got a little bit of an open bleed, but we're at the end. So we've just got to tie it off so that they're not yeah. open bleeding as they walk out the door, but we can't, you know... Yeah. really go in and fix those. I love that you say that because um, it's, it's real for all of us. Uh, we're going to have sessions that will end in, on a sad note, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's very normal. It's not, it's not the therapist's fault. It's part of the process. It's normal. We all get those. Okay? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we... It's so bad. We do, I like how you yeah. said, we can kind of feel like it's our fault that I couldn't get them to end on a happy place. Right. <laughs> Right. This is a painful process. And, and as much as we would want them to leave our offices always very happy and connected, it's not possible, especially at the beginning. Okay. And when, or when we're working with attachment injury, it's, 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 it's almost um, inevitable that they're going to touch um, tender spots all the time. So it's very, very good what you're saying to, um, to do a tourniquet and to even say, oh, I'm, I'm feeling sad because because this session is ending this way. Um, I, I, I also notice how, how sad it is to do all this painful work and, okay, and not being able to relieve some of that pain today. Okay. But we're, we're, we're on this together. We're gonna keep trying. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a very um, close and personal way to show them like I'm with you, you know, and we're not gonna leave it this way. We're just gonna keep working on this cycle until we beat it. Yeah, I love that. I love how you say, you know, that you might say something like, we're, we're in this together and we're going to come back to this. We're going to keep working on it. I'm not going to leave you hanging out there at this spot forever. All right. Most of them are afraid that the therapist is thinking they have no, um, how would you say that in English? They, they, they're helpless. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So they, they fantasize about that. Like, oh, he's, he or she's going to think that uh, we, we shouldn't be together uh, we messed up. Okay. So it's a good thing to be transparent about that and show them like, okay, no, this is very frustrating for us, but we're going to, we're going to stand together towards the cycle. We have another chance and okay? we'll keep working. Okay? And, and I, I've had some clients who have told me that how, how much they appreciate that, okay? that they, they don't feel alone in their fight, in their struggle. I love that you said that. I'm, I think I'm going to borrow that. <laughs> and you know, it's fascinating to me that you said sometimes that I, I never actually ever thought about that, even though I think I've heard clients say, you know, make little, you know, tongue in cheek comments about that. But, you know, that the clients could end up feeling like, oh, the therapist is going to think that we're hopeless, that, you know, maybe we shouldn't be together. And I know that some couples have come to me after other therapists have told them exactly that, which right. Really Sucks. <laughs> that really sucks. Yeah. yeah. And I've, oftentimes it's the opposite where the therapists are blaming themselves and like, gosh, they're going to think I'm terrible that I wasn't able to wave their magic wand and make them feel better. It's, it's my responsibility to make them feel better. <laughs> All right. And how sad would that be that because of those fears mm -hmm. in them or in you, nobody talks about this. Mm -hmm. Like here they are fearing that just as another therapist, you would, um, abandon them, saying them, you know what, I'm so frustrated that I, I don't see this 
this is going everywhere, anywhere, you know? So let's, so they, they're giving up on them, another one. So how terrible if, if, if you wouldn't even say that you too feel bad about them, okay? that you do want to help them. That, that would be a beautiful, transparent thing to do and it really keeps the alliance, okay? Which is another um, point uh, that I would like to make about move five is to always allow room for having it Mm -hmm. for having a good move five, enough time for it, and to check alliance. Always in move five, check alliance. Check what happened during the session, how they're feeling okay, with you about, did you push too hard? That's where you're going to know. Okay? That's the opportunity for them to um, give you feedback about the process. So how would you, so move five is kind of summarizing the cycle, what just happened, you know, we used to call, tying a bow. So I love how you're saying that you kind of use that as a way to check in on the alliance, which is really important because your alliance is continues to be shaped yeah. over the course of your therapy. It's not always instant, fast, and easy, especially with clients that are more guarded and protected. Um, it may take a while for to feel like that safety is built. Um, so how would you, what would you say to a client when you're checking in with them to kind of see how they felt about the, maybe the speed or the temperature or what happened? Well, just, um, just as we, after we summarize what happened, you know, in this session, let's review what happened here. Okay. You just said this and we, we, we touched that pain. We, we understood that sadness and you turned and you were very brave. You shared with, with her. And then you were listening, to, you know, everything that we summarized we load it with attachment and then we can ask honestly, Lana, and I was wondering, can we check on how are you feeling about, about what we did? Okay. Like I, I'm, I'm, I, there's a part of me that's uh, asking myself if, um, if I may have um, pushed you too hard. Okay. When we stayed for that, we stayed longer this session. Okay. We, I, 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 I made you stay in that pain. And I, and I noticed that you struggled. Okay, that you wanted to exit, okay, but you stay there. Okay? So um, can can we can we talk about about it? Like, what what what's that like for you? Did you feel okay? Are we okay? That's really beautiful. I really like that, and that that's a vulnerable question to ask. It yeah. puts a therapist in a spot where they can be like, <laughs> that was too much." And sometimes we do. I mean, if we're really attuning, we will probably get some sort of a sense that they're struggling. But I love that it achieves a purpose of just checking in on that alliance of, you know, helping them to feel active in the process and have some agency over, yeah, I did struggle and maybe I felt a little pushed too hard, you know. Um, and then you may say, you know, if it feels like it gets there again, you know, do you, do you feel like you could let me know, hey, this is too much, too heavy right now? Um, the bigger risk is not knowing, not knowing, not, know, no noticing, not noticing that one of them felt rejected or that mm -hmm. one of them felt um, misunderstood, left out, okay? And that's where you check it. If you check next session, it's too late. Yeah. So that same session, it's just, it becomes a, a question that's, that's easier to, to make over the process, but, but it's, it's an important question to make. Yeah, that's really great. So it really just helps you stay on top of the alliance and keep that in the forefront and make sure that, that you know, you're just continuing to check on that and build that safety. I love that. I never even thought of doing that during Move 5. Yeah, that's, that's, that's how I see the tango. The, tang the tango has room for everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love it. So, you know, what, what we really covered today, guys, was just the ways in which the tango may go good. And if it goes good, great. Kind of steep them, help them savor it, as Ali said. You know, and if it doesn't go so good, that's fine, too. And there's still loaded information in there that will pop up if it doesn't go well that will tell you what you need to focus on, what you need to do more of or unpack some more or make more sense of. And, you know, two of the things that may come up are either blocks in the client or blocks in the therapist or both could happen at the same time. So being able to check in with them, 
being able to check in with yourself about, you know, where am I with working with the motion? What happens for me and my moves and helping you kind of do your own tango with yourself. What do I do when I get triggered? <laughs> you know, your own move one. Um, but, and also using that step five to really check in on the alliance. It was so beautiful. Um, just perfect. That was great. That was so, fun. Ollie, if folks want to find you, if they want to attend a training in Mexico or they want to have you come to the U.S. and do a training in their area, how can they find you? Well, I, I mostly train in, in Latin America. Um, so if they ever want to come to our land, then they, they're welcome. Um, they can find me at um, Ali Barbosa at eftmexico.com. And um, there's, there's, um, there's also the webpage, eftmexico.com. So that's, uh, that's where we um, set the event lists and so they can reach me there. And sometimes I'll, I'll be in Atlanta this weekend um, with a Michael Burnett, nice. helping, him, helping him with a core skills training. I'm very excited about that. So. Excellent. And people can ask you to come to the U.S. and they can invite you to their area to do a training as well, right? Um, they, they have, if they have a trainer there, so they're most likely to turn to that trainer and maybe that trainer invites me to join them. So um, we have these different areas. Yeah. <laughs> so there's lots of areas that don't have trainers. So if that's yeah. the case, they can get in touch with you yeah. and you'll communicate with them and figure out what's what. Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank and you for that. So EFTMexico.com. I'm going to put a link to Ollie's email and the EFT Mexico in the description for this video. Um, so if you guys are, are watching on YouTube and now EFT talk is a podcast on we heart therapy. So you can also listen on the podcast apps. So thank you for making the show a success. Ollie, we just want to thank you so much for being with us on the show and bringing your expertise. No, thank you, Annabelle. I really like that you invited me to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And guys, Mexico would be a fabulous place to go and take some EFT training. The Yucatan side, that's the side with, with Cancun and Tulum and some really cool stuff out there, <laughs> the jungle of Mexico, <laughs> and uh, lots of beach and sun and warm climates to really unpack your learning in EFT and, and Ali is just fabulous. So make sure that you're, you. you're interested, you go look him up and make sure you join the new EFT group, the EFT resource group on Facebook. We will list more of these episodes and any resources from Ali and other trainers that they offer training videos, kind of a one-stop shop that you can find. And, um, Make sure that you guys hit subscribe because more episodes are on the way.